Welcome to the International School of Tailoring. My name is Reza and this is going to be your 17th lesson of our How to Make a Bespoke Jacket series. In the previous lesson, we mark stitched our panels. As we progress forwards, the role of the iron becomes increasingly more important. So, today's lesson is all about ironwork. Ironwork is important because, of course, without an iron, no tailoring gets done. But the iron also allows us to shape our materials. Now, I'm not going to teach you in this lesson how to shape a trouser leg or the back of a jacket, but instead, I'm going to teach you the fundamentals and techniques of ironwork so that once you understand those, you can decide when or where to apply them on. So this is what we're going to do. First, I'm going to show you how the iron affects the weave of our fabric. After that, I'm going to show you the different techniques related to ironwork. And last but not least, I'll show you the similarities between ironwork and the other branches of relative length. You ready? Let's go. Ironwork is one of the five branches of relative length because it allows us to change the surface length of our material and thereby create shape. That makes ironwork also related to other branches of relative length, and I'm going to talk about that a little later. The first question is, how does ironwork, and by that I mean specifically the iron, affect our material? Whenever we look at our fabric, and we zoom in on our fabric to see the molecules, what we would see is the molecules of our fibers arranged like this. Between these molecules, we have hydrogen. And hydrogen creates bonds between our molecules and holds them together. Whenever you take a piece of fabric and you pinch that fabric and you create wrinkles and creases, you are changing the arrangement of these hydrogen bonds. So, what you're doing is you're turning something like this, which is perfectly smooth, into something like this, which is completely out of order. And that changes the length of these hydrogen bonds. Now, by introducing water molecules between these bonds, we can easily realign these distorted hydrogen bonds. So imagine that this is a pipe, a kind of like a flexible pipe, and it's kind of like dried out in this position. As soon as you introduce water, the water will push out the narrower parts and bring back in the wider parts and do that across the entire surface. And that allows us to make realignments or rearrangements in the molecular structure of our fabric. This is also why steam and water makes our fabric pliable. That's also why tailors use it. Now, this pliability of our fibers gives way to four types of rearrangement. The first one is evening out of the surface. The second one is stretching. The third one is shrinking. And the fourth one is compressing. Let's have a look at evening out. So this is how evening out works. Here we have a fabric with a lot of creases and wrinkles. And as you can see, the hydrogen bonds are out of order. What we do is we introduce some moisture, some water, into these fibers with a spray bottle or the steam of our iron. And that makes the fibers pliable. It loosens up these hydrogen bonds and it allows us to rearrange them. Then we put our fabric on our pressing surface. Here, for example, I have a wooden board with a board cloth on top. And as we press down, we not only flatten and rearrange these hydrogen bonds, but we also allow the water to evaporate and be absorbed by the pressing surface. When that happens, our fabric is then set and is hopefully wrinkle-free for a while. This is why it's so important to have a pressing surface that absorbs moisture quickly. And this is also why we use a wooden block to speed the process of absorbing that excess moisture so that we can set our fabric quicker. Because remember, the more moisture you have in your fabric, the more pliable it is gonna be. The reverse is going to happen whenever we make a crease. We take a fabric with an even arrangement of hydrogen bonds and we intentionally rearrange those bonds right on the crease line. If you've ever struggled with taking out a crease or removing a crease, it's because those bonds are probably broken and by being broken, so is the, 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 the holding up of your fibers 
and so it becomes very difficult to put them back together in an even arrangement. Here's how stretching works. Whenever we stretch our material, we are lengthening our material at three different levels at the same time. It's important to understand that these three different levels are not the same. So the first one happens at a molecular level, and that is when we are increasing the gap between the hydrogen bonds. The second one is when we take our curly fibers and by pulling them, by stretching them, we straighten those fibers. Now, if you take a curly hair, let's say, and you pull it apart slightly, you are straightening that hair and thereby lengthening it. However, when you let go, it just bounces back into being a curl. It is only the use of heat and moisture at this level that allows us to permanently, to some extent permanently, keep these fibers straight. The third one happens at a human eye level, and that is when we are pulling the yarns of our fabric slightly apart from one another. Now, all of this stretching at these different levels increases the length of our material. And we know when we introduce length into our material, we are changing a flat surface into a surface with a negative curve. Think of the saddle. Here's how it works. We take our flat piece of fabric, which is cut on the straight grain, and we make one edge of that fabric wet to make it pliable, of course. Then we take our iron, we put the iron on top of the fabric and we just gently pull while we move the iron towards our hand. We do the same in reverse and after doing that a few times we have lengthened that edge of the fabric. Once we've done that and we flatten the fabric we can see that the length is now standing up from the board. Whenever we do this we are turning the flat surface into a surface with a negative curve. So, whenever we roll it over, you can see that this material is now concave and convex at the same time, just like the saddle. If your fabric is cut on the bias, you can stretch the fabric a lot more. The reason for that I have explained in lesson number six, warp and weft, which is you are not pulling the same yarn at either ends. So thereby the yarns can move freely from one another and give you greater flexibility. So if we do the same on this piece of fabric, you will see that with the same effort, I can achieve twice the result. Just like that. Stretching out your fabric is very similar to another technique that we use to introduce length. And that is the insertion of a wedge which is the opposite of a dart. This means that these two techniques can be used as substitutes for one another. However, there are going to be differences. The first difference is that here we have a cut and here everything is smooth. The other difference is that there is only so much that we can stretch out the fabric, but with a cut, with a wedge, we can really open that wedge all the way until we have made a 180 degrees opening, which introduces a lot of length in the material. The last difference is that we can always compress this back into being a flat piece of material, just like this. On this one, however, because we have actually added extra material, it's very difficult to do that. So if we try to do this, we are severely distorting the fabric, as you can see. Sometimes on some fabrics, whenever you've stretched the edge and you wet that fabric, it will contract back to its original flat state. If you want to make the stretching permanent, all you have to do is to repeat the steps of wetting the fabric and stretching it out a few times until you've completely changed the molecular structure of your material. Compression is pretty much the opposite of stretching our material out. So if we look at our three levels, the opposite is happening at each stage. Instead of increasing the gaps between the hydrogen bonds, we are reducing the gaps between them. Instead of straightening out curly fibers, we are curling up straight fibers. And instead of pulling the yarns away from one another, we are pushing them back together. Now, whenever we are compressing our material, we are mainly working at this level because compression requires us to push fabric towards a central point, which creates ripples. 
whenever we flatten those ripples with the iron, the first thing that we are doing is we are pushing the yarns together, which closes the gap between them. Now, I want you to pay close attention. Compression is not the same as shrinkage. The reason why I'm emphasizing this is because tailors would refer to compression as shrinkage. They would tell you, shrink the fabric with the iron. You're not shrinking anything. Why? Here's the reason. Whenever you are shrinking your material, you are not just pushing the yarns together. You are actually changing the molecular structure of your fibers. So, whenever your fibers are raw, before they are spun and woven, they are curled up. During the spinning process, these fibers get straightened out and spun. That puts a lot of tension on these fibers. Whenever these yarns are spun and they are put on the weaving machine, a lot of tension is put on the warp, which is the longest grain, which is the longest yarn, and that tension again straightens out those curly fibers. But as soon as you introduce water on the surface of that material, what happens is that the water shocks these hydrogen bonds to go back to their original state. Shrinkage is permanent. Compression is temporary. Let's see how that works on our fabric. We will begin with compression. Here we have a flat piece of fabric and the first thing that we're going to do is to apply some moisture on the edge of our fabric. Then we're going to take our iron and we're going to push fabric between our two fingers to create the surplus. The surplus is going to be flattened with the iron, like so. And we're going to do that all the way to the other side of the fabric. Just be very careful because if the surplus is too big, you will create a pleat and we don't want that. If you do this with some patience and care, you will notice that the edge of our material has now become concave. However, whenever we roll this over, what you will notice is that the surface has become convex. We have turned our material into a surface with a positive curve, the opposite of the saddle. So that means that if I would hold this up like that, we can collect some water in there and that's going to pull there. Now, you notice that when I was compressing this, I lifted the fabric up like so. This is very important. The reason why this is important is that if I don't do that, I may accidentally go over the entire surface with my iron and I will just simply flatten out my material. So you always want to compress just the edge so that you can create the shape on the surface instead of flattening it. Just as I showed you with the stretching of our material, whenever our fabric is cut on the bias, it is going to be easier to manipulate it. So just as stretching was easier on the bias piece, so will compression be. Again, I will create these surpluses between my two fingers and gently press them flat with the iron. Once I've compressed my edge a little bit and I've got these surpluses right behind the iron, I will push the fabric forwards to get it out of the way and just allow everything to fall into a curve. Then I'm going to repeat that process again. Once I do that, you can see that the concave edge is now a lot more severe than the concave edge on the piece that was cut on the straight. And again, if I roll this over, you can see that the surface has become convex. Now, the question is, why is it easier to compress something that is cut on the bias? Here's why. Imagine that this is our fabric and it's cut on the straight grain. Here we have our warp and here we have our weft. Whenever we are compressing, we are always bringing the sides towards the middle. So if we do that right now, we are going to bring the warps together and that is going to create a massive surplus on our weft. Now, this surplus doesn't have anywhere to go. So if we overdo our compression, we are simply going to turn the surplus into a pleat. However, whenever we cut our fabric on the bias, we change the orientation and position the yarns diagonally. That turns our square into a rhombus. Here's the thing. Whenever we are going to bring the sides to the middle on a rhombus, the length of that rhombus is going to increase while the width decreases. So whenever we're going to compress something on the bias, this is what happens. As you can see, there is very little surplus now floating in the air. 
and it's going to be a lot easier to compress this and flatten it. That is simply the reason why it's a lot easier to press something on the bias. Now, compression with the iron is nearly identical to another technique called a gather. A gather looks like this and is one of the five subsets of relative length which we will cover in lesson number 26. Now, if you look at these two, they are pretty much the same. You can see that here we have a concave edge and whenever we roll this over, we have a convex surface. The main difference between a gather and compression with the iron is that a gather is created with pulling a thread through the fabric. That creates these surpluses and holds them there. Doing this gives us a greater control over exactly how much it is that we want to compress. We can also choose to not compress the surpluses that we create. Now, let's talk about shrinkage. Here we have a piece of canvas fresh out of the mill. Nothing has happened to it and I haven't even tried to take out this wrinkle. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put these threads right on the edge of the canvas and then I'm going to wet it. What I want you to look at is exactly how shrinkage takes place. Check this out. That is called shrinkage and it's permanent. Now I'm going to dry it off and I'm going to wet it again. Two things may happen. It either is going to shrink again or nothing happens and it simply becomes wet. So let me readjust these threads towards the edge. And let's do it again. Now it shrunk again, slightly less. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to dry this off. It's probably not going to shrink anymore. But now I'm going to compress the edges and then I'm going to wet it. Then you can see exactly how compression differs to shrinkage. So I've somewhat dried it off, but it's a little moist. I'm going to use that moisture to my advantage so that I can compress it easier. So let's do that. Here I have compressed this fabric right on the edge and now I'm going to wet it. I want you to pay close attention to what happens in this area once the water comes in contact with the fibers. Did you see that? It just expanded. That is how compression differs from shrinkage. It is temporary. Please don't make the mistake of thinking that if you have stretched the surface out, you can add more shape to it by compressing or gathering that surface back in. You're just resetting the weave to what it was. So this is our summary. Once we make a piece of fabric wet, it becomes pliable. Once the fabric becomes pliable, we can work it in three different ways. The first one is to even out the surface of the fabric, which keeps the surface flat. The second one is to stretch it out and that creates a surface with a negative curve. The third one is to compress the material, which creates a surface with a positive curve. Now, although shrinkage affects the surface of our material, it really isn't a way of working with the material because you don't have any control over it. It only happens once or twice and you can't undo it. And remember, anything that is cut on the bias is a lot more flexible. That means that we can stretch and compress it a lot more and a lot easier. Most of the techniques that I've shown you are fairly simple, but I'm sure that a lot of you will hesitate when it comes down to stretching a piece of fabric or compressing it. So this is what I want you to do. Take any piece of fabric that you have around you and just stretch it until it rips. Play around with it, compress it until it pleats. Take different fabrics at different weights and just have fun. That is the way to understand the technique. You can then take it to the extreme without worrying about it going wrong and that will increase your understanding about the techniques that you've just learned today. That's all. My name is Reza, this was today's lesson and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Take care. Please don't make the mistake of thinking that if you stretch the surface out, you can add even more shape to it. <laughs> Get to the chopper. <laughs> add even more.